Okay, let's start. Uh, Christian Carroll managed to run his panel like a train. It's clear that I've already failed. Uh, I'm already late. But that's usually how trains work, at least in Europe these days. So, anyway, the next panel uh, is about how to roll back um, Russian aggression. Uh, quite a serious topic, I would say, and uh, it's a question mark with that one. And I think we should ask more questions about that. Is Europe and America ready to roll back Russian aggression? Uh, when we talk about Russian aggression right now, we probably just think of Ukraine, but is it perhaps worth thinking about other countries as well very soon, maybe even NATO countries? And perhaps finally, um, the goal is, of course, Ukrainian victory, but and this is a very uncomfortable question. My, my last question I pose here, um, how do we define this victory? And should we redefine it, perhaps? So with me, I have a, an esteemed panel of gentlemen. We are supposed to have a lady in the screen as well, but she's a bit late. Um, ladies are actually never late. They come exactly when they want to come. But it's Tamila Tasheva from, uh, from Ukraine. She's the permanent representative of the president of Ukraine to the Crimean uh, to Crimea. But let me quickly present the gentleman and then we jump right into it. We have retired Brigadier General Peter Swack, a great friend of Ukraine, of course. He's uh, a fellow at the Kennan Institute. Uh, few people know this region uh, as much as Peter do, I would say. We have Mikhailo Sam Samus, uh, also a think tanker, brilliant, from Kiev. Farm, former army as well. I would like to tap into that a bit later. And of course, to my left, Vladimir Sokor, uh, a fellow Radio Free Europe uh, contributor once upon a time. Yes, for 40 years, yes. And uh, of course, now a fellow at Jamestown. So, gentlemen, I start with Peter. Mr. Swack, please. Um, we're talking about un, you know, unrolling, rolling back Russian aggression. But to understand that, perhaps, it's worth painting a picture of what the aggression looked like and what we in the West need to do. So, what do we need to do? Yes, uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, I'd like to uh, start with a short story that will knit a lot of these countries together um, and uh, sort of is my foundational story to Georgia and everything else, very, very quickly. Um, I arrive in Georgia in 1991. This is the gomsent Kordia period in the summer before everything goes crazy in the uh, winter. I come to Georgia in a Lada with another army captain, we're both students, from Moscow. This is the Soviet Union and the roads were still open but everything was collapsing. And we, uh, we flew to Moscow, rented the Lada, then drove down through, uh, through, uh, uh, down through the uh, Donbass to Rostov, through, uh, through, uh, through the uh, Gruzinsky Voyny Chasa, the, the, uh, the highway, um, into, uh, uh, into um, uh, Mount Elbrus. Then we go to um, Gari, and we end up in Tbilisi. And our experience as American, young American officers in Russia, which was open, we were treated a little bit like Martians out there in the countryside when we were going through these, the chaos of disintegrating Russia at the time, Soviet Union. We come to, uh, to Georgia and we're treated like rock stars as the young American officers there just arrived. And it was an incredibly moving uh, period we had there and it sort of set the tone for my affection and respect for uh, your country. Then, as an army officer in Europe, um, I was there when we worked with uh, Partnership for Peace to help with Georgia on that, and also Romania um, and Ukraine. Um, and then, and then uh, was there, sadly, in U.S. Army Europe when the uh, awful invasion of 2008 occurred of Georgia. And there were indicators, all kinds of lessons learned for us today in 14, and, uh, and now uh, from that uh, Russian um, move with uh, Sukhumi and um, South Ossetia. 
Um, and then oh, just just uh, a few years ago, um, b before COVID, I uh, had the privilege of being at no Exercise Noble Partner. Do you remember uh, uh, my, my, our Georgian friends, but other allies, when 10 American M1 tanks end up in Tbilisi with 10 British Challenger tanks? And this was all a pushback at the Russians. And, uh, and, um, but these are steps that are being made uh, post-2014, but we are now where we are today. Um, pushing back Russia, and, and, and oh, the last thing, I'm schizophrenic. I have a long history with Russia. Um, it was an attache there, studied there, but this Russia um, is, uh, has, has become monstrous in the regime. We've talked about the aspects of, of, of autocratic, really dictatorial evolution there, um, and 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 Georgia made an early stand and remain standing, though I know there are challenges domestically, but also we've watched Ukraine make really the defense uh, of our era for the principles that we all stand for, imperfect democracy, but it is a free-minded nation that is looking Russia in the eye. Uh, I believe when Zelensky stayed in Kiev, that first week, when everybody thought he was going to go and urging him to go, was at that moment the Russians were going to lose the early campaign and imbued the Ukrainian, the 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 um, jo uh, excuse me, the um, Ukrainians, but also Europe and your country, um, with oh my God, the Ukrainians are going to fight and they now have a leader and they have been epic in it. It's not been perfect the first uh, two years. Last point, um, the, the, um, where w the discussion, well, where we are two years later, and I, um, I want to uh, come up with um, a prior point that was made. When we consider where we were two years ago, when, when uh, Ukraine was being invaded, we didn't, we were counting days, weeks, for Kyiv would fall and if they would survive, and they're still here a lot because of the efforts of the nations represented here and NATO and the EU, it's not perfect. Uh, and uh, rolling back the Russians, first and foremost, is unity. We have to stick together. Now, the comments out of my own country lately have not been helpful, but I believe we're going to get through this and um, we've got to stay um, uh, united. We'll have our issues. We have fractures, and this is what Putin is counting on. To, one is to take down Ukraine, and in so breaking uh, the, West, the network of, of Western alliance and friendship. Uh, and so, so that is how we beat the Russians back. And it's a sh we're showing the world, Ukraine is showing the world um, that by its defense, its, its stand, and they're not perfect, but we've got to understand they're fighting an immortally existential fight against a malign regime that, that, that is playing all. It's a playbook right out of Nazis in the late 1930s, if you look at it. You take a kusok, you take a bite, you, you see what the reaction, then you do it again. And I have to believe in talking in Georgia and certainly um, uh, countries that are, are bordering Ukraine, the fight in Ukraine is not is 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 really important for your country, Georgia, because if the Ukrainians were to lose, then of course you're worried if the Russians then get bigger imperial ambitions, and of course then the uh, NATO periphery. I could go on and on. How we roll it back, first of all, is we've got to stick together. We've got to get our in domestic politics out of it as much. We've got to get them more weapons, but it's more than weapons. And then the last thing, by sticking together, including my country, we keep giving the Ukrainians hope. It's one thing to fight hard. It's one thing to be determined. But if you feel alone against a merciless invader, then at what point does the grind wear them down? Um, I, those were my opening statements. Mr. Swack, I want to push you a little bit on this, though, because I know you don't represent America, but right now, 
it looks like this togetherness, NATO at least, is undermined by your country. I never thought I would say that. You have the Ukraine supplement that still is not passed. You are in the middle of an election cycle and that will last for quite some time still. And uh, there is the prospect of someone being elected who seems not committed to Article 5, not even to NATO allies. So you say we're going to come through this, but are we? I have to believe in my country. I am very, very worried. And I wouldn't be, I would, I wouldn't be truthful if I didn't say that. But the gravity of this is so serious. And yes, we have a, a, um, an election coming up that is desperately important for the future of my country and desperately important for the future, I believe, of our alliances and networks. Uh, and uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to, and all many friends here and elsewhere, we're going to stay with this thing. And, and, and I think the Americans and other, you know, and other allies, the countryside needs to be educated why this is so important. We maybe have not educated our countryside well. All right, I'm going to say it. Um, when I was in Moscow, I had a young officer working for me for two years directly, Alexander Vindman. You may have heard of him. And it was he, with him in the National Security Council, Lieutenant Colonel, blew the whistle on, on Trump's perfect phone call with uh, Zelensky to put pressure on, Ucra on, on uh, Ukraine to give, give up sensitive campaign information so that the U.S. would then send Ukraine more weapons. And out of it, uh, Trump got embarrassed and, uh, and impeached. He hates Ukraine. I think that a lot of what's going on here, and I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to get into high, complicated, political. He is a vengeful man. He hates Ukraine. Ukraine stood up to him. He got embarrassed. And I think behind the scenes, he's pulling the strings on our Republican Congress. So, um, so we got to get past that. I'm sorry, I'm being brutally honest. I don't like it as an American um, um, that loves my country and generally respects uh, our, our leadership. And, uh, and uh, yes, and, and, and uh, Vindman was getting, you know, just ground down and assaulted by his, by Trump's staff, and that's why he went to help, and that's how it went, and it became. We, NATO needs to continue. Europe needs to continue. Our allies in Asia need to continue to hard strengthen yourselves in case we fall out for a while, let me get at that point. If we really do go, we kind of lose our way, you've got to stay in it. You are all powerful and united, and you've got to work your defense plans and all that. And we're going to be there with you. But that's a key point. There's, there's, you, you, you've got to be, frankly, more independent um, uh, from the United States, saying that we, we will I believe we will get our way straight, and we will, if you want, continue our leadership role in NATO and elsewhere. But this is now, this is hugely your issue, as it always has been, but with military and all that. And that's the only thing um, that, that I think Putin respects is power, is power. And, um, and he uses the nuclear, he uses that nuclear chest thumping to intimidate, he works it on us, but he really works it on our allies and, and, and partners. Um, and we just need to s stick, uh, s just stay implacable with him. We've got your back in that, um, and we're going to get through this period. I'm sorry, I, I'm, I get emotional on this. That's okay. That's, we want a bit it's of emotion to these army. panels it's as well. General seen a lot. So I know. see that Madame Tasheva is with us now. You hear us, we see you. So, uh, without much further ado, uh, please, Madame Tasheva, what, what's your view on this? I mean, you, you're, of course, the representative of Mr. Zelensky in, in Crimea, um, the region of Ukraine that, in fact, saw this aggression not two years ago, but ten years ago. So, you've been living with this for a decade already. Um, do we see some hope there? Because we see that, unlike the Eastern Front, 
uh, the Russian ships seems to be dipping a bit in the Black Sea around Crimea. Your Excellencies, dear guests, uh, dear friends, uh, thank you for having me. Actually, absolutely, totally agree with you that uh, this aggression against Ukraine is started not two years ago, but actually 10 years ago, with occupation of Crimean Peninsula, with uh, persecutions of our Ukrainian civilian, civilians, including Crimean Tatars, Russians, Ukrainians, who are persecuted in Crimea during 10 years. And actually, uh, Russia used the absolutely same playbook uh, against Ukraine uh, two years ago, the same playbook which they used in Crimea in 2014. Of course, it's a, a using of propaganda, it's a using of uh, methods of persecutions against civilians, it's kidnappings, it's uh, killings of civilians. And actually, Russia used uh, Crimea as a springboard for the new Russian offensive and occupation uh, new territories. And actually, they start this uh, occupation of uh, Herson region, of Zaporizhia region, uh, uh, very actively uh, persecu uh, persecute our civilians at these territories. And actually, uh, Russia used Crimea also uh, as a territory where they illegally transferred our population uh, and civil hostages from uh, regions of uh, Kherson and Zaporizhia and uh, Donetsk uh, also oblast. And uh, really very important uh, to remember all these victims which we have in Crimea. And that is why uh, we don't give up uh, Crimea, why we are fighting for our Crimea Peninsula, why we, of course, include uh, issue of Crimea uh, to all the um, uh, uh, all uh, pillars of uh, uh, peace formula, which is suggested by President Zelensky uh, at the summit of uh, G20 in uh, Bali. Uh, for example, when we say about 10th point of peace formula, or when we say about fourth uh, point of peace formula, when we say about civil uh, hostages. And, you know, uh, even if we uh, have 10 years of occupation of Crimea, we see how many people now uh, resist in Crimea. And it's actually very important. And all this success in uh, Crimea and in a Black Sea region with, uh, uh, with uh, withdraw uh, withdrawal of uh, Black Sea Fleet of Russia from uh, western coast of uh, uh, Black, sea, uh, Black, Black Sea or all these uh, targets and attacks on the carriage bridge, for example, or on the military bases. It's absolutely uh, supported uh, by our civilians in Crimea. That is why they are start to resist actively. And uh, I work with the issue of Crimea during 10 years of occupation. And uh, actually even it surprised me because uh, last two years of full-scale invasion, many people in Crimea start to resist. And what they do, for example, they do yellow and blue manicures, uh, they do a tattoos with the Ukrainian symbols, they raised Ukrainian flag in, flag in Crimea, and uh, they do some posts uh, in uh, social media. They protest in Crimea in different ways. And it's really, really very important because after that, they uh, persecuted by occupation authorities, of course. Uh, uh, but it show us that these actions from our military is important in Crimea. And when some persons, journalists or 
uh, politicians ask me why in Crimea, after 10 years of occupation or eight years of occupation, people still resist in Crimea, why after a full-scale invasion? And for me, it's absolutely uh, understandable because in 2014, we don't have a strong military and we don't have a strong state after revolution of dignity, after all this transitional period. But after a uh, full-scale invasion, people in Crimea start resi they're resistant because they understand they have on their backs our military and uh, strong civil society and volunteer movement, and of course, uh, our state, a president, a government, a parliament. And uh, even if we uh, now have a 10 years of occupation, and we understand that the occupation of Crimea, it's mostly on the hands of our military guys and girls, uh, and of course our uh, diplomat political and diplomatic efforts, but even now we work on the issue of reintegration also. It's important for state, and now we prepared all these reintegration strategies, and we show for our allies that uh, we, of course, the occupied territory of Crimea, maybe do not tomorrow, but day after tomorrow, maybe. Uh, and we uh, need to prepare all these reintegration strategies. And we understand that it's really very important signal for our people in Crimea also. Because when we say about the occupation of uh, our uh, territories, it's not only about uh, um, about lands, about piece of lands. It's always also about people, Crimean Tatar, Ukrainians, who are resist, who are persecuted at this territory. That is why, of course, we have a strong position about territorial integrity of Ukraine uh, in the borders of 1991. Of course, we do occupy all our territories including uh, Crimea Peninsula, of course, and city of Sevastopol. And uh, of course, we are uh, appreciate for all support from our international partners, from United States, from European Union, United uh, Kingdom, etc., etc. And uh, many of our partners, uh, they support us uh, in a military way of the occupation of Crimea Peninsula. And it's, of course, important for us. Thank you. Madam, Madam Tershva, thank you very much. Uh, we want to ask questions from the audience as well, so I will go ahead immediately with you, Mrs. Samos. Uh, it seems quite a lot of doom and gloom uh, around the war effort in Ukraine right now. I, I was at the Munich Security Conference and I repeatedly heard Ukrainian officials talk about we're shooting with nothing, we're losing land, we're losing people. Um, how can this be reversed other than just producing shells and ammunition? Can you give us a snapshot of what the challenge is in 2024, but also going further? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you very much for Rondele Foundation and uh, uh, to having me here and uh, actually I'm, I'm very inspired by previous panel on the atmosphere on the questions and answers and actually the openness uh, of, of the uh, auditorium and I, I uh, expect that the same atmosphere will be on our panel uh, starting with the military uh, situation actually uh, we have a discussion actually inside and outside of the country what is the plan what is the strategy for 2024 and 2025 we have actually basically two positions one position to uh, sit on the strategic defense and collect and concentrate the uh, military resources for 2025. But as we know, and actually the uh, general told uh, a little bit about it, that in 2025, nobody can say what happened in the United States, in Europe actually, and uh, both in Russia and Ukraine. So uh, another point of view is trying to surprise Russia even in 2024, and uh, to uh, have a strategic plan to change the military situation 
But in the same time, you know that the because of the turbulence already in the United States, we don't have uh, ammunition, we don't have a, a, a uh, still don't have F-16, for example, which is uh, air supremacy is a key element of any uh, modern, uh, since I, I would say 1970s. Uh, the air supremacy is a key element of any offensive operations. And it was one of the reasons that Ukrainian counteroffensive of 2023 didn't achieve the goals. Because uh, sometimes they're asking uh, why the counteroffensive didn't achieve, why the uh, counteroffensive uh, uh, made uh, so... Uh, I would say a little success because of air supremacy and uh, President Zelensky told that one of the reasons was that the plans of Ukrainian command was on the table of Russians before counteroffensive started. I, I would suspect that uh, when, I, when I found that, for example, the Ukrainian counteroffensive started the 7th of June, but 6th of June happened the, the uh, explosion of uh, Kahovka uh, hydroelectric uh, station. Why? Because Russians knew about it, and they, uh, they, uh, by destroying the hydroelectric station, they flooded a huge area of Kherson Oblast, the left bank of the Kherson Oblast, and they cut the Ukrainian plans for military operation on this area, which was very, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, mm, one of one of the one of the uh, course of action very uh, planned. And what could be, let's say, planned for 2024 and 2025? In my opinion, a, even, even a talking about the theory, Clausewitz's theory about the uh, center of gravity. Center of gravity of this war is the Crimea. It's not the Donbass. And talking about the uh, strategy for next two years, of course, we need to plan something for Crimea. And it's possible to plan for this year. Uh, I, sus uh, I expect that this uh, Ukrainian side will share a lot of this information about these plans, about the uh, course of action, uh, Zaporizhia, Kherson, maybe other uh, 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 areas of operations. But uh, nevertheless, talking about the military uh, point of view, the sense of the military situation, for Ukrainian side, the most important things to keep the asymmetry, because it's a of course, it's, uh, it's understandable. It's, it's impossible for Ukraine to fight with Russia symmetrically because we never will have the same uh, number of tanks, ammunition, uh, armor vehicle of, of fighters. And of course, network-centric warfare uh, and drone-centric warfare, which is a part of the network-centric warfare, uh, now because of the creating the fast making decision process, you could be uh, better on the battlefield, even you have less tanks, less ammunition, and less fighters. I could explain what does it mean to make a decision process in uh, military. It means that target acquisition should be made in seconds, sending the information to command post, and command post in seconds could decide and send information to uh, weapon to destroy the enemy. If you have the seconds, not minutes or hours, to complete the mission, you are winner. Doesn't matter how many uh, soldiers you have, how many uh, tanks you have. If you have the network-centric affair working properly, it's a key element of, of everything. So talking about the uh, forecast, I hope that this year Ukraine will try to surprise Russia by some uh, fast operations on the course of the center of gravity, I would say Crimea, because it's a key element uh, uh, for, for Russians as well. For Russia, in the same time, the main goal will be do not allow Ukraine to break through the uh, uh, front toward Crimea, in the same time trying to break through the front of Donbass. Actually, since October, Russians started the, the huge operations on Avdiivka, uh, Bakhmut, uh, and Kupiansk, into, uh, a little bit northern. And of course, even in the southern part, they're trying to break through the front of the Donbass, but they actually felt uh, that they couldn't make it, shift into the hybrid operations. And I think that next month will be from Russian side, less on military, but more on hybrid uh, operations, including some uh, operations inside of Ukraine. It's uh, disinformation, it's trying to create uh, destabilization inside of political 
uh, uh, forces, etc. You know about these uh, publications of Ukrainian military intelligence, Ukrainian uh, secret services about plans to destabilize the country. So I think it will be a shift to hybrid warfare a little bit from Russian side. But in the same time, if United States actually complete uh, the, uh, our hopes and give us more ammunition, Ukraine will be able in 2024 uh, create some capabilities to uh, break through the front line. I hope for it. And a couple, couple more points that actually very important uh, what we see now that the, this Europe is waking up and Europe started to understand that they need to issue responsibility and leadership in our region. I think it's a very good news because uh, even the United States will keep the, uh, uh, let's say, the, the place in NATO. I think the strategic autonomy and actually uh, President Macron, uh, I would say, idea on the sending some troops to Ukraine. This is a very serious signal that Europe started to be a leader in this, er uh, in this area, and I think that uh, uh, actually it was a discussion on the first panel that it maybe we need to create a new matrix of, of uh, security, not through the Washington, but directly between Europe and Asian democracy. In this, I wouldn't say the contest, because in Ukraine we, uh, we don't define what's happening now, contest before, uh, b between the uh, democracy and autocracy, but actually war, at least conflict, and, and hot conflict between uh, autocracies and democracies. So I think that the new security metrics between Europe and Asia could be a solution for next years uh, in, in situation when United States shift into uh, self-isolation uh, a little bit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sokor. Thank you. So, Mr. Sokor, turning to you now, you've heard about, I would say, slightly more optimistic scenario from Ukraine. We heard about the worries from America. Um, what's your view on this? How to roll back Russian aggression? Maybe not only in Ukraine, but we see it whirling now even in Transnistria. I will attempt a political assessment of the current stage in the Russia-Ukraine war. Ukraine and the West are losing. Russia is winning the war at the current stage. Here are the dimensions of the defeat which is looming and needs to be reversed. Ukraine is undergoing a second round of territorial amputations. Proposals currently under discussion involve the goal of a ceasefire in place, de facto conceding to Russia the territory already occupied in Ukraine in two rounds of war. Ukraine has lost a large part of its economic resources. It has lost the most industrialist part of the country, the Donbass, with the coal mines and the export-oriented industries of steel, machinery, and chemicals. It has lost the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, Europe's largest. It has lost offshore oil and gas projects, it has lost large areas of prime agricultural land, the crops from which are being exported by Russia as Russian produce. Ukraine faces a closed door to NATO membership. The, United, the Biden administration has moved the United States from the camp of supporters of Ukraine's NATO membership into the camp of naysayers. Russia is well on course to turning Ukraine into an unattractive partner to the European Union. When the European Union in December 2002 offered Ukraine the status of candidate country for EU membership, the extent of Ukrainian losses was not yet apparent and perhaps could not be anticipated 
in December 2002. At the present stage, the costs of integrating Ukraine into the European Union are becoming prohibitive to the European Union. There is also a backlash, again unanticipated, a backlash in the European Union, especially on the part of agricultural interests against integrating Ukraine. The Biden administration has framed the struggle over Ukraine as part of a larger global contest between democracy and authoritarianism. At the same time, the same Biden administration has under-resourced its support to Ukraine and to NATO. As a result, defeat in Ukraine will discredit the Biden administration's own global democratic agenda. War is a test, is a test of a state's effectiveness. It is also a test of the persuasiveness of the ideology that underpins the state in question. Defeat of the West and of Ukraine in Ukraine will undermine the legitimacy of democratic theory worldwide. It would, on the contrary, prove the superior effectiveness of, a, of the Russian autocracy compared to the democratic West. Current solutions that are being widely proposed in the United States, including from the highest academic circles and think tanks, involve a partition of Ukraine along whatever ceasefire lines would emerge at the moment of a ceasefire. The models being invoked ubiquitously in the American debate, not in the European debate, in the American debate, the model invoked is the Korea model, the Germany model of 1945, 1955, the Korean model of 1953, the Cyprus model of 1974. I have discussed all of these models in my publications for the Jamestown Foundation's Eurasia Daily Monitor. The difference between the situation in Ukraine now and the situation in Germany, Korea, or uh, Cyprus at those times, the differences could not be starker. There is no analogy possible between the current situation in Ukraine and those previous partitions. Yet, we seem to be headed for another partition of Ukraine, formal or informal, purely military or perhaps also politically. Certainly not recognized internationally, no, but de facto partition. The debate is revolving around concepts such as, and I'm quoting the terms, the terminology, peace, armistice, ceasefire, frozen conflict, post-war situation, political settlement, diplomatic settlement. None of these apply anymore in the age of hybrid wars. All those concepts applied for in an earlier stage, in an earlier historical stage, where there were clear distinctions between a state of war and a state of peace. Nowadays, all those concepts have a hybrid character. It is a delusion to believe that we have the option of declaring a freeze unilaterally. Or it is equally delusional to believe that there will be a post-war situation or a peacetime situation. There will be no such thing because any temporary arrangement, any armistice, political or purely military, any ceasefire, uh, will have first a temporary character and secondly, a relative character because the ceasefire will not be a full one as in Korea, for example. It will translate into a situation of continuing warfare 
as it did between 2015 and 2022, continuing warfare, mostly of low intensity, punctuated by high intensity phases. No peace is possible without Russia in the a with Russia with Russia in the age of hybrid war. How does the West envisage uh, a hypothetical, unrealistic uh, post-war or peacetime uh, security for Ukraine after those territorial amputations, unless they are reversed? How does the West imagine it? Not through NATO membership. There will be no invitation to NATO, not even a step toward invitation to NATO at the Washington's uh, NATO summit in July of this year. Instead of NATO membership, what is offered is security commitments. It is a system whereby individual member countries of NATO will offer individually in their own national names, will offer security commitments to NATO. Commitments, of course, are on a lower level than guarantees. A number of European NATO member countries have already signed such agreements with NATO, uh, with, with, sorry, with Ukraine, including Great Britain, France, uh, Italy, uh, Denmark, and a couple of others. These are political agreements. They envisage military and financial assistance to Ukraine in the event that it is attacked again. What these agreements do not envisage is the following. Stationing of partner countries' troops on Ukrainian territory. Joint exercises by the troops of partner countries with Ukrainian troops on Ukrainian territory. The intervention of troops from the partner countries in Ukraine in the event of an attack. None of this is envisaged. What is envisaged is military and financial assistance to Ukraine if, if it is attacked again, and the development of uh, defense industry in Ukraine on the basis of joint ventures between Western firms and Ukrainian firms. So all in all, all this falls far short of what NATO membership would guarantee to Ukraine. These are political and declarative agreements. Uh, what would be Ukraine's international status under this dispensation? Ukraine would become, if this comes to pass, Ukraine would become, first, a rump state. Second, a rump state with contested borders in the east and the south. Thirdly, it would become something in between a western borderland and a protected buffer. It would not be a member of an alliance. It would be a semi-protective protected buffer between the West and Russia. Admittedly, a Western-oriented buffer. And to a limited extent, a Western protective buffer. But not a member of an alliance system. I forgot to mention that those bilateral agreements between various member, NATO member countries and Ukraine would not be covered by a general framework agreement. Such a general framework agreement could have amounted to an alliance, but these would be only bilateral agreements. And the NATO member countries that enter into these bilateral agreements with Ukraine will not be covered by the North Atlantic Treaty in the event that their assistance to Ukraine would bring them into conflict with Russia. In the meantime, the Western, the United States and other Western countries, not all of them, 
but the United States and many other Western countries have conceded escalation dominance to Russia. The overriding goal of most Western powers, not all, but most Western powers in this war is escalation avoidance and avoidance of the spread of the conflict beyond the border of Ukraine and the deliberate de refusal to carry the war into Russian territory on the Western powers' own responsibility. Only Ukraine is allowed to attack targets in Russian territory or in its own name, with its own weapons, not with weapons supplied by, by the West. The United States does not have a victory agenda in Ukraine. It does not even have clear war aims. The United States and NATO collectively have never identified a strategic rationale for their support to Ukraine. This undermines their own case for support to their own publics. The publics, Western publics, do not perceive a strategic rationale for supporting Ukraine. They perceive sacrifices, economic sacrifices, but not strategic payoff. All this will need to be overcome in order to, as this panel suggests, rolling back Russia's aggression in Ukraine. What would necessitate rolling back Russia's aggression in Ukraine? First, arming Ukraine for that purpose. The summer 2003 offensive of Ukraine did not really fail. On, on, on the factual level, it failed. But it not so much failed as it was doomed to failure. It was foredoomed to failure. It was predetermined to shatter against Russian defenses because of inadequate resourcing of Ukraine by its Western partners. That predetermined the outcome of the 2003 counteroffensive. Call it failure if you wish, but it's not a failure of Ukraine. It is a collective failure of the West. So what would be required in order to roll back the Russian aggression? First, arming Ukraine adequately to that purpose with long-range precision weapons and abundant ammunition. Second, it would be necessary to bring Russia's own territory into the argument by attacking it from Ukrainian territory with Russian, with Western supplied weapons, and namely attacking high value targets in Russia. Thirdly, it would be necessary for all Western governments led by the United States to explicitly disavow the proposal to informally or formally partition Ukraine along the Korea, Germany, or Cyprus models. I would like to emphasize that these proposals are ubiquitous in the American debate. The Biden White House has never dissociated itself from these proposals, and some of them do indeed emanate from supporters of the Biden administration. These need to be disavowed. These are the most basic steps that would make it possible to reverse the current looming defeat. The defeat would discredit not only the democracy agenda, would discredit NATO itself NATO failed to deter the Russian aggression in the first place. And then it adopted, as it usually does, it adopted the common position on the lowest common denominator, which is to minimize the day, to reduce the damage, to control the damage, but not to reverse the Russian 
accomplished facts on the ground. So all this will need to be reversed in order for Ukraine and the West jointly to win the war with Ukrainian lives and Western resources. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, I just got the, the wonderful news that I can eat in a bit to your wonderful Georgian lunch, so that's great. Thank you for that, Vladimir. It was uh, a tour de force, and I think that your sort of uh, glass thing sort of preempted a bit what the speech would be, you know? But anyway, breaking glass and breaking hopes, huh? But <laughs> anyway, uh, let, I think you have piqued a lot of questions here. So uh, let's start immediately. Let's roll three together. We have a gentleman there, we have a lady there, and a gentlemen there and some housekeeping rules please and then we have a lady there as well some housekeeping rules please 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 introduce yourself tell me who the question should be to and avoid any big speeches thank you very much sir thank you Arek Kochinian research center on security policy from Yerevan uh, thank you very much for the panel discussion mr. Sokor thank you for your honest speech it was uh, refreshing and, and 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 very important in my opinion so uh, regarding your speech clearly understandable what should be done to win the war in in ukraine and to not to let the ukrainians fail in their in their fight for freedom and the fight for freedom that they're doing not only for themselves but also all of the post-soviet republics honestly speaking but would that be enough uh, victory of ukraine would that be enough to uh, come back to the international order, the rule-based international order, because even weakened Russia will still be dangerous for countries like Georgia, Armenia, Moldova, smaller because they will be more evil, they will be, uh, they will be uh, lost, they, they, will, they will lose the world, they will become more evil and, and possibly will try to revenge on, on smaller countries. So what should be done in order to build up the new architecture of rule-based international order in case of Russia? Thank you. I will take the lady there, maybe. Thank you. Uh, Olena Snigir, European University Institute. Um, first of all, Mr. Soccer, thank you very much for your clear speech and for the truth. And my question would be to the three panelists, to Tamila Tasheva, to Mikhail Samus, and to you, um, Vladimir Soccer. Putin uh, always puts Crimea as a holy grail for Russia. Thou, uh, Russia, Russia's weak reaction to the destruction of Black Sea Fleet and to, Crimea, to uh, Ukrainian attacks on Crimea show that it's not really so, but it can be the real uh, weak point of Russia, of Russia in general and of Russian leadership if Crimea is retaking by Ukraine back. And it seems that from the military strategy point of view, it is easier to be done than to regain first the whole occupied online territory uh, of Ukraine. Uh, so if Ukraine gets back the Crimea, or at least blockade it from, cut it from Russian uh, connection, destroying the bridge and deoccupying the uh, Kherson direction. What do you think? What kind? What would it would it help uh, in general? And what implications? What consequences it will have um, on the whole theory of today's conflict? Thank you. Okay, and what, what, sir, as well, I, I keep I remember the questions. Thank you, Georgi Muchaidze, Atlantic Council of Georgia. Vlad, thank you uh, for bringing the clarity, utmost clarity, to the discussion. Uh, my question would be, uh, well, uh, quite a number of years ago, when we were talking about the uh, Georgia's uh, membership in NATO, the uh, proposal was floated, which was supported by the former NATO Secretary General, Rasmussen, which was going like this, that, you know, the Georgia can be accepted in NATO with its entire territory, but the Article 5 would only cover the part of the territory that is controlled by the central government. And, in, in Georgia's case, we have some kind of clarity, you know, we have some occupation, more or less, you know, clear occupation line. Do you think that uh, this uh, concept can be applied to Ukraine? And if yes, what can be done? What can the supporters of the Ukraine uh, can do to make it a reality? Thank you. Okay, we have a 
few more questions over there, but let's take these first and let's spread them out a bit. So, so Vladimir, if you could talk about the revanchist Russia and what sort of impact that would have. I would like Mrs. Tasheva, if you can talk about the Crimea Bridge and what impact that would have. And then the Rasmussen Initiative, basically uh, Article 5 on the territories that uh, Georgia, let's say Ukraine control, but not the sort of occupied territories. Uh, Mr. Swack and Mr. Samos, you, if you can take those sort of questions. So we start with you, Mr. Stoker. Please, let's be brief because we have more questions. If I understood correctly, two questions were addressed to me. One about possible follow-up aggressions by Russia, and another question about the territorial extent of any security guarantees to Ukraine. Uh, about follow-up steps. Uh, I do not anticipate Russia attacking any NATO country. I do anticipate Russia making mischief in the Black Sea region. I do believe that the Black Sea region is more vulnerable compared to the B Baltic region vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Especially after Sweden and Finland joined uh, NATO, the Baltic region seems, uh, seems uh, ironclad in terms of security uh, from Russia. The Black Sea region has all along been the main stage of Russian revanches and territorial revision. Ever since 1991, the Black Sea region has been the main arena of Russian expansion, re-expansionism. And this has been underappreciated in the West, remains underappreciated. In the event that uh, Russian troops make their way in the direction of Odessa, either as a result of military advances on the ground or as a result of the weakening political order in Ukraine itself, approaching Odessa would result in Moldova switching sides from the western side, with which it is now aligned, to the Russian side, and Moldova being turned into a Russian-oriented buffer state between Russia and the West. I also do anticipate that Russia would make mischief in the, in the uh, Black Sea in terms of international shipping, export-import uh, shipping bound to or exiting from Ukraine, and against oil and gas offshore uh, projects in Romania and Bulgaria. I anticipate that as well. In other words, challenges below the threshold of Article 5, but challenges with the, with, uh, to which NATO collectively seems uh, ill-prepared to respond. Western, the navies of Western powers have been absent from the Black Sea since before the outbreak of the war, since December 2021 as a result of political decisions made in Washington and Brussels to clear out of the Black Sea, December 2021. So I expect that to be a prime target of any Russian follow-up aggression below the threshold of Article 5. Uh, about the territorial extent of any security assurances, commitments, guarantees uh, to Ukraine uh, following a hypothetical armistice. Uh, NATO guarantees are not on the table. I'm aware of the discussions that has taken place in Georgia a few years ago, before the war, uh, about Georgia being admitted to NATO, while the Article, Article 5 would not cover the Russian occupied territories. I'm aware of this deb debate. I participated myself in this debate at that time. It has remained inconclusive. That was about Georgian NATO membership, hypothetically. Right now, NATO membership for Ukraine is not on the table, as simple as that. But the commitments, the system of which I described a moment ago, those would apply only to Ukrainian controlled territory would exclude Russian-controlled territory. As was the case in 1955 when West Germany was admitted to NATO, but NATO's guarantees did not cover 
the territory uh, of the then German Democratic Republic. Uh, it is a very hard question to resolve whether to accept or not to accept uh, security commitments, guarantees, assurances that would not apply to Russian occupied territories. That would inevitably be construed as abandoning de facto claims to, to those territories, even if on paper nobody would recognize this, uh, giving up those territories. It would never be recognized on paper, but it would be the practical result. Thank you. So, Madame Tash, if I turn to you now for the question on the Kersh Bridge and what the impact that would have. Um, uh, another issue, it's absolutely uh, legit legitimate targets, if we say about carriage bridge or another military bases in Crimea, it's very important to say, because Russia, uh, all what they do in Crimea, for example, uh, Tarida uh, Highway or uh, Simferopol International Airport or carriage bridge, or another these uh, military bases, it's absolutely legitimate targets for Ukrainian military uh, forces. And of course, Ukraine do not target civil infrastructure in Crimea. Of course, carriage bridge is very important. All you understand all this uh, supply uh, chains uh, for, for Russia, how they use Crimea bridge uh, to uh, transfer all the, this military personnel, all these uh, uh, military techniques, of course. But when we say always about Crimea, and when we discuss the issue of Crimea with our international partners, or for example, with uh, different think tanks, or for example, with the journalists, um, you know, I always uh, hear um, uh, issues that Crimea is uh, important, of course, but it's, you know, it's a, a very, um, very different case, what we see, uh, what we hear from our some allies. And why they say it? Because it's during uh, uh, tens of years of totally propaganda in even Western European countries or in countries of global south that Crimea is a Russian lens. And we actually always say, no, it's a not a Russian lens. It's a Ukrainian land, which is absolutely connected with the mainland of Ukraine. It's a territory which is colonized by Russian, uh, Russian Empire or Soviet Union Empire or Russian Federation, which is colonized where they changed demographic composition during the centuries, unfortunately, more than two uh, centuries ago, they started these colonization processes. That is why uh, the territory of Crimea, of course, important for us, not only uh, with a military issue, but also for um, important for us as a, a, a place where we have a indigenous population and all this indigenous population, Crimean Tatars, Karaites and Krimchaks are suffering unfortunately and persecuted. Of course we need uh, to deoccupy the territory of Crimea and of course we need to targetly destroy Crimea uh, carriage bridge and it's absolutely possible for Ukrainian armed forces. All our actions now in a Black Sea and uh, uh, against a Black Sea fleet and their headquarters in a Sevastopol, it's uh, absolutely important. And what we see, it's uh, possible. And of course, we need for uh, that target uh, more uh, military uh, support from our allies, of course. But it's absolutely possible, and it's really very important to deoccupy uh, Crimea. Gentlemen, I want to bring in you very quickly as well on the on the on the Rasmus, so-called Rasmussen plan about Article Five. We can talk, Mrs. Swack, first, please. Hello. Yes. Um, again, we all remember um, we all remember uh, Minsk, the 
Minsk Accords 2015 that ran, you know, right up almost uh, before the, uh, the follow-on invasion. And uh, what we saw with that freeze, call it a ceasefire, we call it a part, um, it was a frozen conflict. And um, whatever is done to freeze the line uh, and, um, and create circumstances of negotiation insofar that the Russians get some type of legitimacy for being on that occupied territory. We're talking now post, uh, uh, we're, we're talking now post February 2022, 20, um, but you really got to go back to 2014. Um, and um, I, I appreciated, Doctor, your uh, um, discussion about the former other partitions and, 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 um, and, and, and lines and history and all that. I don't think it just won't work. And so I, I, I think that standing tight with the Ukrainians and backing them is something that is so important for Europe. If the Russians get their way, they get a frozen conflict, which is what happens if there's a ceasefire or, or truce line. Um, this is just, uh, this is just um, there is going to be no reconciliation between the Ukrainians and the Russians in the next generation, at least. And it will probably go war or worse. Russian military, which has also learned a lot, will continue to rearm. It may look elsewhere on the periphery, I think they will see a partition as a sign of weakness and a victory. And this will um, absolutely uh, dishearten the Ukrainians. So I think we have to think about all those, all those uh, factors. And I just want to say one thing about um, Crimea. I know we're short. Um, from what we'd say a military perspective, it's, it's key terrain, you know, most of it's water. Um, and um, the Ukrainians, remarkably, this is going to be written in the history books, has used um, outmanned, outnumbered asymm asymmetry in the Black Sea to take the war. The, the Russians just lost another warship two days ago. Um, and, and the Ukrainians have used their ingenuity and their technology to, uh, to stress um, uh, the Russians as my counterparts that blew up their headquarters. But this is so important because one concern, and this is why Harrison in the area is so important, if the Russians were going to try to use Crimea again as a springboard to finally roll up the southern Black Sea coast, maybe, uh, maybe stir up problems in Transnistria, uh, which becomes a huge Romanian problem and elsewhere, and then breaks the, uh, the revised, if you will say, Black Sea grain route via Romania and, and, um, and Bulgaria. So this is the Black Sea is critical. The, the Ukrainians have somehow turned the tables on the Russians, um, taking it maybe too hard, but, you, but uh, taking down the Karish Bridge with long range fires, which have partially been provided, but more needs to be from my country, Germany and elsewhere, would be hugely helpful. There will be an improvement in the Ukrainian Air Force, but I don't necessarily know if that would be enough. But, and, and then maybe you find a way to snap the land bridge, but we have to be realistic in expectations about a major Ukrainian counteroffensive because the Russians are going to be building up their forces defensively as well and offensively. Um, uh, and, and so I think the next summer is going to be uh, really uh, quite um, in interesting is not the right word, but uh, it will be um, very, very important. Uh, the Black Sea is critical, not just for Ukraine, for Ukraine's survival, the viability, choking Crimea off from its land routes through Kerch will be a way to do it and maybe allows it to wither the fuel on a vine. Um, so I, I agree with uh, my counterpart. It's critical. It's the one place Ukrainians can bring the fight seemingly effective to Russia. Last thing, the Ukrainians are in a grinding, I mentioned earlier, a grinding, I believe, stalemate with 
Russia, where Russia right now has the momentum. And it's this ugly, gradual gnawing now at the Russian, at the Ukrainian lines. We saw it, uh, we saw in uh, uh, Avdivka, and we see Robetnia, and we saw it, uh, and, and, and this is a, um, a fight that, that Ukraine does not want to fight indefinitely, and it all in the end are going to end here. We in the West, the United States, need to provide, besides the weapons and the rounds and all of that, you've got to provide hope to them that, that, that we're in it with them through the end. The messages from it become hugely regional and global to include, from the U.S. perspective, China's watching, uh, uh, the Middle East is watching. And one other point, who could have imagined for 7 October, which was a black swan for Israel, but for Ukrainian prospects and focus, it completely took the air out of Ukrainian support from a lot of our countries, including our own. And this was terrible for Ukraine, um, as it took the focus off that, and that is going to be playing out. That was a gift for Putin. What happened? What is happening in the Middle East? And and we can't. That is still happening. It's distracted our country enormously, and many of yours. And that's one to watch. So Ukraine is in it. They're going to fight the Crimea. And the Black Sea is a critical front, and they need to be sorted ever which way is possible. Thank you, Kelly. You've been itching to go. So just yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, I would say that I am not agree totally with Dr. Sakhar. I know to start. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, good start. Yeah, why? Because you used uh, uh, too categorically the uh, perfect tense. Ukraine has not lost territory, has not lost anything yet. Why are we fighting? So hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian soldiers fighting every second uh, without uh, any, you know, the without any uh, uh, thinking about the lost in the hope. So if you're talking about the uh, military situation, if you're talking about the military situation on the battlefield, uh, I would say that uh, talking about the Crimea, I uh, again uh, like to uh, say that the center of gravity of this war is Crimea. The, uh, why? Because uh, besides of the occupation of territory, Russia occupied the, the Black Sea actually. So Ukraine now, by uh, asymmetric uh, efforts, by sea drones, they push out Russian fleets uh, uh, already and destroyed 30% of Black Sea fleet already. 30% of Black Sea already destroyed. So it looks like not uh, the uh, uh, lack of hope. I think that we, we will produce more and more sea drones and will destroy the Black Sea fleet. Totally. I'm sure of that. Next step, of course, this year will be the, uh, the summer operations on Kherson Oblast, I think. And uh, I would say that uh, let be uh, together, let be together hope for Ukrainian soldiers, which is fighting. There were two quick <laughs> questions. But yes, that's. We had, I saw three hands there. Can you bundle them together very quickly? And then I think I have to, I'm afraid I'm, I have to close this otherwise, you know? So. Maybe the gentleman as well over there. Yes, yes. Please, quickly, quickly, quickly. Yeah. Uh, at the position of the U.S. Atlantic Council, definitely share the shadow of espresso point by Mr. Zucker. So what we see currently is that the West um, declares red line for it. We see all the statements, what the West is not going to do. Could you please recall and name any of the red line that the West uh, named for Russia? Thank you. Neil. Nino Gelashvili from the RFRL Georgian Service. I will have a question to Mr. Sokor also. Um, how can anyone be sure that the NATO area is ironclad protected from Russian aggression and can deter it if it happens on its territory until there is no consolidated victory agenda? of the West in Ukraine. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kandela. Yes, thank you. Very quick one also to Vlad, of course. We are in Georgia, so uh, 
The question would be this, how does Russia see Georgia in this strategic picture? And does the West, particularly the United States and its administration, really understand the Russian game in Georgia? One last there, and then I really have to close, because Hachapuri is getting cold. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn Hainde, our analyst. Yes, you are rightfully talking about the uh, situation in the Black Sea, uh, which is very vulnerable uh, now, really. Uh, especially in the light of Russian aggression against Ukraine. But we have to pay attention to what is happening in Russian-occupied Abkhazia, where Russia openly declared the intention to build military naval base in Ochamchira and is constructing airport in Sukhumi. Who needs airport which may have connections with a couple of Russian cities? It's definitely with, uh, uh, it is constructed, uh, you see, to have uh, direct flights and supply Russian military base in Abkhazia. And in case of some complication in South Caucasus, uh, to be used as a military airport. This is not the question, this is just statement. Thank you. Okay, so I think most questions were to you, Mr. Sokor. Um, if I understood the questions correctly, what was about the, what are the red lines for Russia? And the other question about the uh, purportedly ironclad security in the Baltic region. Uh, ah. Ah. What, what are the red lines that the West... Red lines that the West respects vis-a-vis -vis Russia? No. So, So you know that Russia is asking a lot of red lines for the West, but it's the West. No it's the West. Lines. Red lines. Yeah, so if the red lines drawn by whom and respected by whom? Jump on it first. Then, yeah. then we, we, let me jump on this. I think the only defi definitive red line is NATO, NATO Article 5 for the NATO nations, and then we have our various uh, partnerships. Uh, that is, um, I think, the core aspect, and then the Russians do respect that, saying that if they think that we're, NATO is wavering, or the U.S. is wavering, and they are winning in Ukraine or elsewhere, then they get emboldened, and then I think that risks Georgia, that risks a number of other countries, and, um, and also one other country, as go Ukraine, goes Belarus, who has been absolutely rogue lately. Should I repeat? Just, yeah, I just, I just uh, following the uh, red lines, and, and you asking about the NATO a lot uh, regarding Georgia. Uh, in Ukraine, we understood uh, a long time ago that NATO it doesn't issue responsibility on non-NATO countries. Forget about it. So NATO is not a leader on our region. NATO just respects own security. It's a club of countries who respect and issue responsibility on security. That's why Ukraine and Georgia needs to be uh, uh, responsible for each security, uh, own security. I done this. Weapons of mass destruction. I don't know what the answer is. We haven't talked about nuclear, chemical, and that specter still, the Russians throw that out there, and, and, and I think more to intimidate than, than you, but it's there. It would be a red line. I don't know what the reaction will be, but it will be dramatic. And another red line that really is in, flouted by much of the world 
um, is the ICC indictment on Putin, and now two generals. And while the indictment is out there, uh, Putin has been able to now travel out of the country to include Saudi and UAE without worrying about these international norms. And somewhere in there is a red line, too. So, Nino and Eto, can you please secondly re-ask the question? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, my question is actually a continuation of uh, Eto's question, the previous one, um, that if until there is no consolidated victory agenda in Ukraine of the West, agenda of the West, I agree with you, there is no negotiated and agreed agenda, victory agenda towards Ukraine of the West. Who could be sure that the NATO is ironclad protected uh, from Russian aggression? Are you sure that, uh, because it's not only about military uh, force and economy, it's, uh, it's about being ready for that and uh, letting Russia to cross another red line. Understood. Just to briefly add, so my question was that the West imposed this red line on itself. We are not going to do this, we are not going to do that. Is there a red line that the West imposed on Russia? Do we know clearly what the, the red line for the West, for Russia is? Okay. When the West will act? What will be the last resort? <laughs> so, so the question is really... Ah, okay. Okay, I understood both questions. Uh, th they are interrelated. I think they are almost interchangeable. Uh, Russia, of course, analyzes the correlation of forces in each distinct theater of action. And there are distinct theaters in terms of vulnerability. The Baltic theater is far less vulnerable. In fact, after Sweden and Finland joined NATO, I think the Baltic theater is uh, practically uh, invulnerable. Still, also in the Baltic states, Russia could present some uh, challenge below the threshold of Article 5. For example, moving the border in the Narva district of Estonia by 100 meters, hypothetically. Or uh, staging some kind of uh, unrest in Latvia and then uh, claiming that uh, Russian-speaking population, quote-unquote, uh, is being persecuted. Something like that. Uh, but the Black Sea, as I mentioned, is Black Sea region is far less secure and far more uh, uh, vulnerable. What NATO must do is to use the window of opportunity it has in the next few years to rebuild its defense industrial base and to uh, increase military manpower. NATO has not anticipated the result of full-scale conventional war, uh, World War I style, combined with 21st century hybrid war. American and NATO intelligence, political intelligence, has not anticipated this development. Now, thanks to Ukraine, Western powers have a window of opportunity of a few years to rebuild their in, uh, defense industrial base to the requirements of full-scale conventional war and do the same with military manpower. This is the window of opportunity. Failing that, we will face a cascade of defections from the Western Bloc, from its fringes, from its most vulnerable fringes. For example, Moldova will switch from the pro-Western camp into a Russian-dominated, Russian-oriented camp, although formally a neutral buffer. Bulgaria, where we well, may see a change of government. The current government of Bulgaria is the most pro-Western government in Bulgaria since the early 1990s, and it has a narrow majority. Undoubtedly, the fence-sitting parties in Bulgaria will switch to a Russian position, and some of the pro-Western government may find themselves forced realistically to switch to a fence-sitting position. We already see this development in Slovakia. We saw it earlier in Hungary. 
a few years ago. So on the fringes of NATO, on the exposed eastern fringes of NATO, fence-sitters may turn pro-Russian and pro-Western circles may turn fence-sitters. All governments will need to reassess how they respond to certain Western, uh, to certain Russian requirements. This is the way diplomacy works. Governments adjust to the evolving situation. There is one way to answer Russian requests or demands, Russian demands, if NATO is strong and reliable, and another way to answer Russian demands if NATO and the United States are perceived as less reliable. All this is at stake in Ukraine. Russia's war on Ukrainian territory is a war against the West on Ukrainian territory. Ukraine is merely the territorial arena of a war against the West. This is what the West does not comprehend. Or if it does, it, does, it is unwilling to react to it. The broader uh, aim of Russia's war in Ukraine is to change the European security order to discredit NATO, to demonstrate that the United States is unreliable. To avoid this outcome, we need to win in Ukraine. Otherwise, Russia will go on, and after a hypothetical victory in Ukraine, Russia will go on to the next step. It will demand some kind of conference for regulating the European security order, establishing or defining what is alliance membership, what does it entail, what is neutrality or non-alignment, what do they entail, what is Russia's role at voice in a new European security order. Russia will demand a major voice and role in a modified security order in Europe and there will be enough countries in governments in Western Europe and in Central Europe, especially in Central Europe, to be willing to entertain such Russian demands if they are intimidated by a Russian victory in Ukraine over the West. Thank you. Now we have to wrap up. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks.